Hello, welcome to History Speaks, presented by the Ottawa County Historical Society. I'm Katie Swank. Thanks for being here today. I'm your narrator for today's presentation. History Speaks is what we call our group. The name also describes what we do. We tell stories. Nancy Dunham, Nancy, can you wave? There's Nancy. Barely. Okay. She founded our group and directs our efforts. Nancy is a long-standing member of the society, a past president, and currently she serves on the board of trustees. In keeping with today's Civil War theme, our storytellers today will take us back 150 years through the words of some who lived it. Most of the war between the states was fought in the South, and Ohio is not thought of in terms of a battleground, but its participation in the war was a major, a major part. Right here in Ottawa County, just a few hundred yards from this spot, right over that way, is the site of an installation most important to both sides. Early in the war, the federal government selected the 300-acre Johnson's Island as a prison site is a location for the prison of captured Confederate officers. On 40 of those acres, they built blockhouses, a hospital, guard quarters, a bakery, and 12 two-story barracks. The first prisoners arrived on April 10th of 1862. In our archives, we have a copy of a letter from an area man named Arnold Coffin, the letter tells of his daughter taking a large kettle of soup to the train station and she ladled it out to arriving prisoners. In his letter he wrote that some of the soldiers wept. They were touched by such kindness from the northerners. A few years back there was a man from Toledo who stopped by the keeper's house with a tale about an ancestor of his who had taught school in Marblehead during the Civil War. And that brings us to our first storyteller. She is a vital contributor to many of our events and she also serves on our board. Here is Kathy Leonard performing Aunt Marion's Ghost, who is also written by a piece written by Nancy Dunham. Good afternoon, my name is Kathy and I'm one of the docents that greet people at the Keeper's House and we share stories about Benaja Walcott, first Marblehead Lighthouse Keeper, his family and his times. He was a Revolutionary War veteran and my story takes us to the Civil War. Many times visitors to the house bring their own stories with them and in 2009 a gentleman from Toledo stopped by with a story that he called, as you said, about Aunt Marion's ghost. Now Marblehead is a peninsula that lies along the shore of Lake Erie, not too far from the international border between the United States and Canada. In the early 1800s, Immigrants from Eastern Europe came to work the stone quarries. The company built them little houses arranged along a village street. There was a church, a bar, and a grocery store. The men worked in the quarries all day, the moms kept the house, and the children went to school to learn how to read and write and how to do their numbers. Now imagine a little one-room schoolhouse in the wilderness. I was their teacher, and it was my job to teach them what they needed to know to be good citizens. Whoops, excuse me. I'd go there early in the morning and sharpen the pencils and sweep the floor. In the fall and the spring, it was easy. I just opened the door and let the children in. It was called the lake effect. The warm waters of the summer kept the peninsula warm and colorful throughout the fall. In the winter, it was a different story. The wind blew cold across the lake. 
I'd have to get there really early and start a fire in the old iron stove. I'd open the door and get the fire going and light the sticks. And by the time the children came, the room was hot. Now the children, many of them had to walk about a mile to get to the school and I would worry about them as if they were my own children. What if they would get stuck? What if they would get lost? It was my job to keep them safe. There was Hanley Meyer and his little sister Joellen from the butcher shop. There was Doc Brayer's boy from across the point and sometimes he would bring little Amy from the lighthouse. Now they had the lighthouse keeper's daughter. They had to build a lighthouse in 1822 to warn the ships of the rocky shores along Sandusky Bay. Since Robert Fulton built his steamship in 1807, there was a lot more traffic on the lake. By 1861, we were in what history would call the Civil War. I would tell my children, we are at war. We believe that slavery is wrong. We are fighting for the Union. The South is fighting to keep their slaves. By 1862, there were bloody battles on both sides. It was hard to tell who would win the war. Now, Johnson's Island is just off the shore in Sandusky Bay. And they had built a prison camp here in 1862 for Confederate officers. Now imagine a little island surrounded by water, far from the fields of the south. When we first heard the sound, it was a snowy day in winter. It was like a foot dragging across the floor. We all looked up. What could that be? Delilah Cooper said. Now, she was a girl who was not afraid to ask questions. I think it might be a ghost. And I said, oh, no, children. You know there's no such thing as ghost. And if there were, why would they want to come to school anyway? But Adam, Adam Noblet said, well, we all heard it. And we looked at each other. There were 14 of them all that year, the year that they thought they heard the ghost. At first I told them it couldn't happen, but I began to wonder. I began to get a little worried. Now there was just one room into the schoolhouse. You'd open the door and there was a long narrow cloak room where the children hung their hats and coats. There was just one big room where I taught the lessons with a stove and a one window looking to the outside. There was a loft above, but nobody ever went there. You'd have to drag a heavy ladder from the cloakroom, and there was just a narrow opening, and you'd have to lift a heavy lid, heavy lid. and you know, why, why would anybody really want to go there? The school was empty the day I set about to see if there was a ghost. Because I kept hearing sounds, but the sounds that I heard were not like that one thump. It was like a slow and steady process across the rafters, as if someone were searching for something. But what were they looking for? What did they want? It was Hilde Smith who finally saw she thought she saw the ghost. We were in the middle of a spelling lesson, and it was Jerry Turner's turn. Now, Jerry Turner was a champion runner, but he could not spell. I tried to make it easy for him. The word was dread. I said it slowly, dread. And Jerry started, D-R-E. Oh! Oh! Hildy said, oh, I see it, I see it, it's a face, it's floating through the rafters. We all looked up. Oh, no, oh, oh, the children. It's a ghost, it's a ghost, there it is. But 
I didn't see it, but all the children were convinced that they saw it, and I'll have to admit, it made me nervous. So after that, I started leaving food at the bottom of the ladder that went up into the loft, and every morning when I came to school, the food was gone. It was only in the months ahead that we found out that there had been a Confederate soldier that had escaped from Johnson's Island. It was winter when he escaped, and the lake was ice, and he'd gotten as far into Canada before he told his story. He said he'd nearly died, he'd nearly starved, but it was little scraps of food along the way that kept him alive. You see, I said to the children, but they did not believe me. They all believed that Hildy saw a ghost. I turned it off. Oh, I turned it off. Okay. And thank you, Kathy Leonard. Okay. The Union strategy to sequester captured huh? officers way uh -huh. up here in northern Ohio severely depleted leadership among the rebels. In 1864, the Confederate response was authorized by President Jefferson Davis. An attack the island's prison to attack the island's prison and liberate the desperately needed officers. The plan involved capturing the local ferry that ran here between uh, Detroit and Sandusky. The name of the ferry, the Philo Parsons, made stops at Put-in Bay, Middle Bass Island, and Kelly's Island. Historian Rich Norgard has written an account of that incident and as a recollection of a 16-year-old resident of Put-in Bay. Our next presenter is Sue Dole of Port Clinton Playmakers. She is performing as Serena Pritchard. Sue? Hello, my name is Serena Pritchard, and I have lived on South Bass Island all of my life. And I'm almost, well, I'm not getting any younger, so I hope you don't mind if I sit and tell my story. We Islanders call, always called it the Bay, after the town of Putin Bay, our little town here on the island. A few hundred people live here year round, but in the summer months, people come from all over Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, just to have fun and enjoy themselves. But after they leave, it gets pretty quiet. And it, the island is just about the nicest place to go fishing, swimming, or just relax. Now really nothing ever exciting happens here, but there was a time when there was a lot more excitement than anyone ever, ever expected. I'll never forget the date as long as I live. I remember it. It was September the 19th, 1864, because that date was just two days after my 16th birthday. The terrible war had been raging for nearly four years and most of the men from the island were still away fighting for the blue. All that was left were, besides us women were men too old and young boys too young to fight. We mostly spent our days working in the farm fields. There were a few orchards, or vineyards, I'm sorry, vineyards, but not nearly as many as there are now. When I wasn't doing that, me and many of the women gathered at the dock, waiting for the steamboats to arrive, bringing supplies and mail, and hoping for a letter from someone fighting in the war with news of the war. My parents were too old 
to fight. But my brother John was down in Tennessee fighting for the blue. When the war was over, he came home safe and sound. But while he was gone, I feared the most. Well, September 19th was a beautiful day as I remember. The lake was as calm as a mill pond. We'd been hearing that the war might end soon, so we were feeling hopeful. But we'd also heard of reports of strangers on the islands. Some folks said that they were rebel sympathizers, but I thought that was just a bunch of gossip because people here just love to gossip. Well, I had gone down to the dock that morning to bid farewell to my Aunt Irma, who was heading down to Cincinnati to spend the winter with her sister. She was scheduled to sail on the Island Queen for Sandusky, which it did every morning. And she got off okay. After that, I hung around the dock to chat with a few of my friends. I was about to head home when I noticed a crowd gathering. So I asked someone what all the fuss was about. And they said that the steamer Philo Parsons was overdue getting in from Detroit after stopping first at several Canadian islands and Middle Bass. So I decided to chat some more. After the afternoon wore, wore on, the crowd got even bigger waiting for the Parsons. I could tell from the looks on their faces, people were starting to get worried. Well, I got tired and I went home for a while. But curiosity got the better of me, so I went back down to the dock to find an even bigger crowd. I walked up to an older gentleman and there was worry on his face. I asked about the Philo Parsons and he said, she still hasn't come in yet. Not only that, the Island Queen hasn't returned from Sandusky. And she always comes back after stopping at Middle Bass. Well, it was getting dark and everyone was anxious. Someone suggested it had something to do with those strangers in town. Another suggested that we secure a boat and go over to Middle Bass Island and investigate, but no one volunteered. Eventually, some folks got tired of standing around and drifted on home, but I decided to stay along with a few dozen others. I'm glad I did because a short while later, there was a commotion down at the dock. I went to investigate, and in the dim light, I noticed a group had formed around a frail little old man. He was speaking rather excitedly and waving his arms, and I found out I was able, able to gather that his name was Captain George Magel, and he had been a passenger on the Island Queen heading from Sandusky to Middle Bass. He said that a large force of men, armed to the teeth, had taken possession of the Queen and the Parsons and were holding the officers and crew of those vessels as prisoners. He got so carried away telling his story, I thought he might collapse at any moment from the strain. Please, I urged the folks, be quiet and let the man speak his mind. Well, they listened and Captain Magel and explained that several dozen rebel conspirators had boarded the Parsons and hidden a cache of weapons somewhere on the boat. The leader of this band was a fierce young man named Bell. The captain said he was a true believer because he had fire burning in his eyes. The captives demanded to know what Bell's intentions were. 
Bell said he intended to capture the gunboat Michigan that was anchored in the bay and liberate the Confederate prisoners on Johnson's Island. Everyone shouted at him that this was madness, but he was confident, confident that his plan would succeed and nothing would dissuade him from it. Magel said the captain of the Parsons pleaded with Bell to release the passengers in the, er, onto the island, as they had no means of alert, alerting the authorities. To this request, he relented. He gathered the passengers together and made them promise to take no action for a period of 24 hours. The passengers, to a man, gave their word and they were released. Captain Mago looked around at all of us and said, that was one promise I had no intention of keeping. As soon as darkness fell upon the island, he found a small boat and slipped across the channel to the bay to sound the alarm. The, as you can imagine, the air was filled with a great sense of foreboding. Folks began spreading the word of this treachery and soon residents from all the islands began to gather at the bay. Everywhere there was panic and shouting. There were women crying, fearing for their children. A few able-bodied men still on the island gathered to form a military to defend the island against the rebels. Suddenly, I saw the bearded and stoic figure of John Brown, Jr., son of John Brown of Harper's Ferry fame, and he began to bark orders at the men that were hastily assembled to defend the island. It was a motley crew, and though I doubted their military prowess, he could not fault their zeal. The rest of us were told to go home and to await further orders. With a heavy heart, I hurried home and told my parents of the situation, and we gathered together our valuables into a small trunk. Before long, a messenger boy came to our door, shouting, get up! The Steamer Island Queen and the Philo Parsons are in the hands of the rebels. Hide your money and your valuables, and if you have any firearms or ammunition in the house, get them down to the bay. Next door, our neighbor, Gladys Tyler, and her twin boys were filling the wagon with their possessions. She told me she was going to the woods on the west side of the island to hide their possessions and invited us to go along with them. Well, this we did. And after secreting our possessions, we, re we returned home to await further word, not knowing what was happening or what to expect. The air was filled with rumors and exaggerated claims, and no one thought of sleep. Well, the sun rose on another beautiful island morning. Folks began to come out of their houses as word spread that the plot had failed. I spotted one of the men from the hastily assembled military unit who told me he had heard that the plot had been smashed and he was on his way home for breakfast. It was then I decided to breathe a little easier. Later that afternoon, a tug arrived from Sandusky and made it official, bringing word that the Parson, the, bringing word that the officers of the Island Queen, who had been taken prisoner on the Parsons, were safely landed and on their way home. The plot had been foiled. They said that the leader of the rebels, John Bell, had escaped to Canada, and but his men had all been captured. 
our island people were safe at last. Some days later, I heard that one of the conspirators went on trial in Port Clinton with this interesting defense. He said that because he had been fighting on behalf of a sovereign power in the time of war, the court could not try him. Well, the judge found in his favor and he was released. Later still, I learned that Mr. Bell had been captured and he was hanged. Eventually, life on our little island home returned to normal. But as long as I live, I will never forget the day that the rebels came. So just what was the plan? One man can tell us the full story. He was involved from its inception and came from Virginia to carry it out. Patrick O'Keefe performs for you as John Yates Bell. John Yates Bell, privateer in the service of the Confederate States of America, the Honorable Jefferson Davis presiding. I feel compelled to come here today and tell you the truth about what happened. Now you folks up here in the North, you refer to the Civil War. The war between the states, uh, I deign to suggest that there was no civil war. What the activities of the last four years have been has been a struggle by the southern way of life against a Yankee incursion. Now you hear, heard here today the story of a woman on Putin Bay Island. Well, I'm going to tell you what really happened that day from a much larger point of view. It was a fine morning we departed from Detroit on the follow Parsons. I wasn't on the ship to begin with, but a man named Bennett Burley was. Mr. Burley, he approached the captain, Captain Atwood, with a suggestion that he pick up some extra sightseers on the islands of Sandwich and Malden in the Canadian waters. And the captain went along, and so he picked up sightseers. Well, those sightseers and I was among them, those sightseers were rebel soldiers pretending to be sightseers. And what the captain didn't know is that in the trunk that we loaded onto that ship was enough arms to, enough weapons to arm 30 men. So we crossed the Erie, the, the, we crossed Lake Erie without incident, pretending to be sightseers. And it was when we approached the local islands here that we revealed who we really were and we took over that vessel in nothing flat. Oh, a few shots were fired, all right. But nobody was seriously hurt unless you count that one poor Yankee boy that took a mini ball through the jaw. But he was okay, he survived. So we approached Sandusky Bay and I told Captain Atwood that he'd better just do as we say or he might get a mini ball through his jaw or some other part of his body. So Captain Atwood, being the wise man he was, he did what we told him to do. And we held up 
just outside the bay. And here we had the magnificent lighthouse starboard, the town of Sandusky to port, and far in the distance was our objective. The USS Michigan, a 14-gun ironclad warship, the only one on the Great Lakes. We had a man on that ship, Charles Cole, and his task was to serve a special dinner to those crew, to the crewmen of that ship, laced with poison. And once he had done his deed, he was to fire a flare, letting us know that it was time for us to move up and take over that ship, free the prisoners on the island, and turn that ship to our purposes to wreak havoc on the Yankee shipping on the Great Lakes. So we tarried at the entrance to the Sandusky Bay. We tarried and watched the sun go across the sky and finally set in the western horizon. There was no flare. And we tarried through twilight. There was no flare. And we tarried after twilight and darkness fell and there was still no flare. There was not to be a flare that night. What we didn't know, Charles Cole had been found out two days before. And what we have since learned is that Charles Cole was in fact a Yankee spy. The skullduggery. The darkness fell on our plan to liberate our brothers, our brothers who were languishing in that prison, languishing with freezing cold in the winter, starvation in the summer, their only moment of joy being the possibility of catching and skinning the privy rat to add to their supper. In the, I was all for attacking the USS Michigan, flare or no flare, but my men would have nothing to do with it. They said, we didn't come here to die for no noble purpose. We can't put a passenger ferry against a warship. So in the morning, we turned and headed for Canada. And at the Canadian shore, we scuttled that tub and just about everybody escaped cleanly from our plot that never happened. So that's what really happened that day. We were traitored, traitored by a Yankee spy for the cause, against the cause, the cause of the Southern way of life where by nature the cream rises to the top. And those officers in, our, in that Confederate prison on Johnson's Island were the cream of the Confederate cause. Now as for me, I rejoined the fight and tried to do my best to harass shipping on the Great Lakes. But I was caught in Buffalo, and now here I am, a would-be liberator of the rebel officers, and now here I am, among them, one of the prisoners, surrounded by Union soldiers. Tomorrow, I have a date with the rope. <laughs> now, a friend of mine, a well-known actor fella, you may have heard of him, John Wilkes Booth. Why, he is petitioning the President of the United States for clemency. I don't hold out no hope for clemency. Not from that rail-splitting buffoon from Illinois. I am ready to die for the cause. Now, Mr. Booth says if he don't get his way and I don't get a pardon, he will make sure he will personally make sure there is hell to pay. Meanwhile, 
I am ready to give my life for the cause. Okay, Patrick O'Keefe. With war's end in 1865, the prison closed, but not all the Southerners went home. Many remain to this day on Yankee soil out there on Johnson's Island, marked by rows of headstones, over 260 in all. Many years later, in the early 1900s, excuse me, a poem of few brief lines was given to Elijah Taylor by a former prisoner. Here is Jeff Bugby, also from the Port Clinton Playmakers, performing as a rebel soldier, a veteran soldier, far from home. Howdy, my name's Elijah Taylor. I was 22 years old, married, had a son, another baby on the way. When old Jeff Davis and Bob Lee, they, they started calling up this army. Well, I was working my farm and I thought, well, I best go do something. So, along with a lot of other boys who were shopkeepers, farmers, they did everything. We all signed up. Now, granted, we was all trying to defend our family and our homes, but we was also had one thing that kept us all together, and we was fighting for the cause. And that was the whole thing that we went north for. Well, I started out, and uh, I was just an infantry man, but because I had some schooling, mostly because I was encouraged by my mammy, or occasionally my pappy's boot. Uh, I got to be good with numbers and reading and writing and all that, so they made me a lieutenant. Well, after one big skirmish we had with them Yankees, and we whooped them good that day, this colonel comes up to me and says, man, you got leadership abilities. Well, hell, I know what he's talking about. I figured it was just because I run faster than the other boys and was always out in the front of the thing. So he made me a captain. Well, I got put in charge of hauling the supplies up north. We had a big old wagon train going that way and one day we was going along the road and all of a sudden all these Yankees come out everywhere and there was thunder and lightning and booming and big explosion went off right next to my horse. Well, I blacked out. Next thing I know, I, I wake up and I'm in a Yankee prison camp. I got no horse, I got no gun, I got a big old bandage around my head. So they had us all sitting around there for a while and a few days later they, they loaded us officers up in a wagon and, and headed us north. And next thing I know, we's on a train going north to some place called Ohio. Well, they hauled us up here, and they took us out to this island. Now, mind you, this island was bigger than my whole damn farm. And so they hauled us out there. They called it Johnson's Island. And so I looked out, and I, I seen all this water around. And, man, I'm a poor old Georgia boy, and this is more water than I ever seen in one place in my entire life. I couldn't believe it. And this whole island just surrounded by this stuff. So they, they put us down there and they, uh, they built us some barracks and we was all in that thing. And you know, during the summer it weren't bad. Uh, we, we tried to go grow a few crops and uh, it was tough though because there's so doggone many rocks around there. So we, we had very little luck with that. Um, didn't do much of anything else, though. Well, we, we learned this new game called baseball. We played that. We helped spend a lot of hours doing that. I personally don't think it's going to catch on. But uh, so then in the wintertime, man, it was cold. 
and that ice was all around. Man, we was just a freezing in there. All we had were them little blankets and not many clothes, and some of them didn't even have shoes. And it was, it was pretty bad. But uh, somehow I managed to survive, and right near the end, a good friend of mine, Luke, uh, he, he passed on, and he done give me this poem. And he said, someday when you get a chance, read it to some folk. So here goes. Farewell, thou giant island sea, girding this isle, washing its lonely shore. Farewell, thou lake. Farewell, thou inhospitable land. Thou hast the curses of this patriot band. All save the spot, the holy sacred bed, where rest in peace our southern warriors dead. Thank you, Jeff Bugby. And that concludes our presentation here today. I'd like to introduce again uh, the president of the Ottawa Historical Society, my father, Patrick O'Keefe. Uh, I want to thank, uh, that concludes our presentation, but I want to make sure we thank the performers, uh, Kathy Leonard, Sue Dole, uh, John, Bates, yeah, John Yates Bell, uh, and uh, Jeff and our narrator, Karen, I mean, Katie Swain. Uh, the reason I almost said Karen is Karen is my wife and Katie is my daughter. Uh, if you ever saw Karen, you know where Katie gets her. But I want to also uh, thank uh, especially these people who, who come here year after year, both as our Yes, and is our participants. John Hoffman with the 73rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry and his band. Brian Porter, a local man with the 14th Ohio, uh, Ohio Volunteer Infantry. And we have something very special today. Uh, one of the uh, members of the uh, 73rd was also a member of the Ohio National Guard 122nd Army Band. His name is John Connors. And John uh, has offered to honor all of the people who died during the Civil War in that terrible tragedy. Go, my friend. Uh, TAPS was ori originally something that got started during the Civil War. And the, uh, 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 the over there will be providing a salute to our John Blaze John? 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 John?